Hello YouTube, hope you're having a great day today. Um, I'm reaching out to you today to talk about a sequel um, to a book that I reviewed earlier. Um, um, and that book was The Moat in God's Eye, uh, written by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell. It was their first um, novel uh, that they wrote together in 1974. It was actually nominated for a Hugo Award. And it is this iconic um, and strong first contact novel for this civilization set about a thousand years later from now. Um, and this civilization <coughs> has spread across the stars and has never come across sort of an alien, uh, a, a con a, a, an intelligent alien before. Um, so now you're going to have your first contact that's set really far into the future, which is interesting. It's very well done, very scientifically grounded. doesn't have a lot of the sort of psycho babble that you would normally kind of associate with this era's um, science fiction writing. It's very hard science fiction, very sweeping. Um, and both the aliens and the humans have uh, both heroes and, and villains among them um, and are very well done, very fleshed out. So today I want to review um, uh, the, the sequel to it was written in the 90s um, called The Gripping Hand. Normally I'm not going to review a lot of 90s works in this channel. Um, this kind of comes later. This channel's whole point uh, is, is this channel is entitled uh, The Worst Thing About New Books, which is a which is the first part of a quote by a French philosopher named Jacques Joubert. And Joubert said that um, uh, the worst thing about new books is that they keep us from reading the old ones. And there's all these great old classics that are out there. Why are we reading the newest book that gets published when we know it's not going to be as good as these great classics that we just haven't read yet? Normally the 90s is going to be after the whole point of this channel, which is to unearth these great um, science fiction, fantasy, and horror classics for you. Um, but because I've already done the first book, The, <laughs> the Moat in God's Eye, which I'll link to you below, um, as well as uh, another another uh, novel by this tag team duo, um, I'm going to go ahead and do the sequel for you now, even though it was written like in the 90s. <laughs> uh, because it does, I think it's pertinent to, to a book that we just uh, reviewed. Um, I'm actually doing this review right after I did the one uh, for The Moat in God's Eye, but I'm not I'll publish it for a while because I want to give you a chance to read it because the first book was like 550 pages long. Um, I also reviewed for you uh, Lucifer's Hammer, which was written in 77. Both of those books, uh, Lucifer's Hammer and Moton God's Eye, were nominated for Best Hugo of the Year uh, for Best Novel. Um, and the science fiction category are uh, heavily well received, sold over a million copies, um, and both of those are are done by the tag team duo of Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell, who are considered probably one of the best science fiction writing duos out there. Um, and they did a lot of these great and heavy works together, particularly those two. Um, so again, today we're going to be doing the sequel to *The Moat in God's Eye*, which is *The Gripping Hand*. Uh, *The Gripping Hand* is uh, set in the same universe, about 25 years later. It's going to be following two characters from the first novel uh, throughout it. And these two characters are going to be um, getting permission to head back. Now, you cannot read this novel without having read The Moten's God, The Moten God's Eye. You just cannot have done it. It's not possible. Um, this is not an, an, a sequel that can be read on its own. Basically, this novel is going to be answering a lot of the questions that the first novel left unanswered and filling some plot lines and coming up with a permanent sort of solution. This is not the second book of a trilogy. Once you read it, you're like, mm -mm, story's done, concluded, um, and such, and we're going to move on, uh, which makes it odd to me that the uh, sequel was done to it by the, <laughs> the daughter of Jerry Pornell later on. Uh, this is set in um, uh, Larry Pornell's, Jer I'm sorry, Jerry Pornell's world, um, and Pornell's world is... Um, and I've mentioned this uh, for a while. We talked about it for a few minutes in my, my first review of the world um, in the moat in God's eye. It's heavily male-dominated um, in Christian, um, and his society is very heavily male-dominated in Christian. I'm not sure if that's because Pornell, intent, like many a fantasy science fiction writer, uh, will, will predict the future. If he intended that to be the case, uh, because he just believed that was going to be the case moving forward, or if he that was his own bias creeping into the work, I have no idea. But that is going to be something that's going to be the, the, the case for this one as well. Uh, um, so now, um, what I am going to do, I'm going to be totally honest with you, is in the first few chapters here, you're going to find out if you have not read <laughs> The Moat in God's Eye, do not watch this review. Read that first, and then come back to this review, because I have to end, <laughs> I have to tell you where that novel ended to pick up where this novel is going to pick up. Does that make sense? Normally, I don't give you reviews, but I'm, and I'm only going to give you um, the first few chapters of this one just to kind of get you set it up. But basically what happened at the end of the Moat in God's Eye, which is set in this uh, Murchison's Eye area, um, is that they ended up with a blockade in this star. Um, as a reminder um, in the universe that um, they're writing in uh, how stars are created, kind of the stellar um, astro geography of that solar system and nearby systems, means that you have different points where you can hyperspace into and out of effectively. 
and efficiently. Um, and you can't do it from other places within that. And this is not a, uh, a Jerry Pornell only contact concept. Many other universes um, and science fiction universes use this concept, like Battletech, for example. Um, you have the, the Lagrange points the, um, and some other stuff, or pirate points that you can go to only temporarily. So this is not only the only place where this is a, a basic sort of science fiction concept. Um, previously, the system that in, in place for this first contact species that they're going to refer to as the Modis um, is, um, uh, and the, the Modis, the, the main issue with them in the Moten God's Eye, which I won't obviously talk about in that review, um, is that they were willing to lie and cheat and steal, um, and they get pregnant. Um, and their, their, their level of their birth rate means that they have so many people that get born that there's a lot of conflict that happens. Um, and they're, they're genetically engineered with a variety of different races um, and species, um, such as workers and, and soldiers and such. And their soldiers are more powerful than our Earth soldiers um, and such. And um, they constantly um, have to reset their society because they keep um, destroying it over and over and over again due to overpopulation and, and warfare and strife and conflict. Um, and there's actually a museum that you're going to come to near the end of the Moat God's Eye. It's going to tell you all that information. Um, uh, and then the humans have to make a decision and they decide to blockade uh, the planet because the only point out of that planet was through this um, uh, red corona sun of this of this giant planet called Murchison's Eye uh, with this red supergiant nova which you can't survive unless you have advanced shields. So they have this blockade in the only place that the Modis can come out of their system um, in order to prevent the Modis from going anywhere else. They've also thought about just annihilating them. Uh, and there was a group of humans who wanted to do that. And in fact, one of those is going to be the one of the two heroes of this <laughs> novel. The other one's going to be the one who preferred the blockade. The blockade has is, 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 is now been in progress for 25 years. Um, what they found, once they do some research and, and show up, they realize that there was this star that was becoming, um, being formed. The Modis uh, told uh, the first expedition 25 years ago in the Moten Gansai that it wasn't going to, to be founded for about uh, probably a thousand years. They had lied, uh, and in reality, after doing some research, it's probably going to be coming out in just a few years. Um, and, as, uh, and that's going to change where the points are and give the, the system additional points uh, out of the system through, the, through jumping and such. So that's, that's, so once they realize that and they do some, some checking in, they're going to go check it out and they're going to see that there's this fleet of motor ships that's just jumped out of their system into a new system. Um, that's going to be a few chapters into this book um, as we follow two of the heroes from the previous book, or two of the, well, heroes might be, two of the protagonists from the previous book. One of them is definitely not a hero. Um, but once you follow the two protagonists uh, from, from the previous book that you're follow, continuing to follow, it still has this typical Niven Purnell sweeping arc with lots of things that are going to happen. Um, and obviously it's going to try to come to a conclusion, and this, this novel will conclude uh, the sort of conversation with the Modis much more satisfactorily than the first one did, uh, which uh, the, which was just a kind of a blockade for in, in, in perpetuity, which they find out won't, won't work. And, and and it wouldn't have even made sense because as soon as they figured it out that they had to invent um, uh, shielding technology, they could have done so very quickly because of the engineer class they have, uh, which can develop, which can change things very quickly in the watchmaker classes, the watchmakers they have, which can modify technology very quickly, as we saw in the first book, when they modified spaceships uh, that they captured from the humans, they modified them, and they actually advanced the human shields um, beyond what humans had been able to do over a thousand years, they were able to modify them very, very quickly. They're a very intuitive race. Um, so for that reason, we're going to have the, it would never have been a, a long-term solution anyway. Um, it would have always had an issue. So 25 years later, they, they find out that their gravitic gravitics of the, the gravitic nature of the system has, has altered to the point where uh, new points are founding and, and they're now jumping out um, and you're coming across that. And the rest of the book is going to be kind of dedicated to what do we do now? And now the motives have, have other ways out um, and so forth. And there's, again, um, just like the first book, there's going to be different factions within both the Modis um, that are living in the Moat in God's Eye, as well as um, the, the humans themselves. Um, so there's going to be this sort of, you know, factions. What are we going to do with the Modis? What are we going to do with the humans? Um, you know, how are we going to, to, to move forward with this? And I think that, again, the ending to this one is much more satisfactory than the ending to the first one. So obviously I'm not going to spill it. Um, you know, you know, come anywhere close to, to the chapters that are going to sort of end that for you. But I do think that it's a very, very satisfying. Now, this book was published in the early 90s. It's much, I'm going to tell you right up front, it's a shorter novel by about 100, it's like 150 pages shorter. It's not anywhere near the length of the other one, even though 
when I looked at them on my shelf, they're both the same size, but this one was printed in the 70s. Um, and it's because it was printed in the 70s, it look, it's got this thick, dense print that's harder to write. Anyway, this clock ended about 550 pages, and this one's here is about, about 400 pages long. So it's not as long of a read, but you cannot read this without having read this. It's just not possible. Um, it doesn't, it's not, you know, sometimes you'll have a sequel that's kind of like, hey, especially if it's 20 years later, <laughs> you know, the first one's written in 74, the next one's written in 94. <laughs> uh, you know, normally you might have that stuff that like you're not expecting your readers to have read the first one or something like that. That's not the case in this at all. You cannot read The Gripping Hand without having read The Moat in God's Eye. Uh, the title for this, by the way, comes from this Modi expression because they have three arms. Um, they have on on the one hand and then on the other hand, much like we do, and then they have a kind of the stirred in on the gripping hand, um, which is where the, which is their strong hand that they have on the other side of the body. Uh, it's less dexterous, but much more strong. So that's where it comes from. It's a phrase in their society and culture, uh, which is popping up in places outside of Modi's, which which gave leave which which was what sort of starts the conversation of what is what to do with the modis and why have this sort of um social uh, uh statements of of, of on the gripping hands suddenly become popular in these different systems what's happening so that's this that's that's the the gripping hand again it's a strong strong novel check it out um it's not as good as the moat it's not as good as lucifer's hammer it's not as good as a lot of the sort of 70s science fiction that these two did but it's still fine um and, and it's still well done um so check it out if you've uh have you read the gripping hand what'd you think of it did you prefer i'm sure you preferred the, the moat in god's eye but did you prefer the ending to this one to the moat what did you think did you think it was the appropriate ending or not i love to talk with you about it in the comments below and while i try to keep my this spoiler free i'm happy to engage in spoilers in the comments below i'm happy to talk with you about that if you disagree with my review let me know um, I will give you a link again to, in, in the section below to the uh, review that I did on The Moat in God's Eye, so you can review that first. And then also, I'll give you a link to the Amazon if you want to pick it up, so you can check it out yourself. Um, as well as to my first review I did of uh, this two tag team, uh, Pornell and Niven together. This will probably be my last one. I still have about four or five books uh, from Niven and Pornell combined, but I'm probably this is probably going to be my last review because again, the goal of this channel is to give you some of these great classics of these of, of, that have been forgotten, and I do think that that the two that I did already plus this sequel are I think the two great ones <laughs> from the 70s. And while they do have some other ones like Footfall out there, I just don't think they're as nearly as good or Oath of Fieldy. I don't think they're anywhere near as good um, as this. The two that we did already, and then the sequel to one of them as well. So, what did you think of this one? Please let me know. If you like this, hit that subscribe button. There's going to be so many more classics to follow. We're also going to be doing the, the occasional analysis for you as well. So, there's going to be so many more videos for you to follow. And hey, if you took some time out of your day to watch this video, I want to thank you so much. We all have busy lives. We're all doing lots of stuff. So, the fact that you spent any amount of that, that day with me, that's just very humbling, and I really appreciate that. So, thank you so much for your time. Have a great day.